Oh, hello folks, this is Michael Odin here. This is the first lecture in Caribbean Island Ecology, Bio 3070. And this one is an introduction to what we're going to be looking at in this course. What sets islands apart? So first of all, we're going to look at what are islands. Um, some of you may be surprised to know that islands are not just pieces of land surrounded by water. There are other types of islands, which can also be, uh, what's the word, can also be incorporated, can also be thought of as islands. We'll also take a look at the, what makes island, uh, physical features of islands, and what makes islands special to people. We'll take a look at uh, life on islands, because this course is uh, Caribbean island ecology, and ecology deals with living things. We'll take a look at socioeconomic features of islands because people affect the living things on the islands. And we'll take a look at life cycles of islands. Finally, we'll take a look at some of the different islands in the Caribbean, which should be revision to most of you. So first of all, what are islands? Well, we got a definition from the Encyclopedia of Islands, which um, you'll probably be reading various chapters of that all through this course by Gillespie and Clark, 2009. And they define an island as an isolated piece of habitat that is surrounded by dramatically different habitat, such as water. So the main point of that definition is that the habitat which forms the island is isolated from other similar habitat by a completely different uh, type of habitat. So that isolation uh, is crucially important. The isolation can have many different properties, just like the island. So uh, an island can be isolated by a sea of water, or it could be iso isolated by a sea of sand. We also call that um, habitat surrounding the island, which isolates the island, the matrix. And we'll talk more about that later. So it's the combination of the properties of the island and the properties of the matrix, which cause the isolation, which dictates its biogeography, which dictates the life that occurs on it and why that life is there and whether that life can persist and solve. So just some visuals to um, clue you in on what islands are. So this is the classic example of islands, piece of land surrounded by water. Here's a picture here. This is New Zealand uh, in a place appropriately called the Bay of Islands, a whole set of different islands surrounded by water. We can also think of the tops of mountains as islands, because these habitats are very different to the uh, habitats at lower altitude. Quite often they're colder, and in the tropics, quite often they're wetter, and they may be surrounded by forests in these alpine zones, or they may be surrounded by desert in other parts of the world. I've got an example here. This is in our next door neighbor, Venezuela. These are mountains known as tapuis. Um, they are, occur scattered um, all through Venezuela, uh, south of the Orinoco River, on top of the Guyana Shield. You may have heard of them. As you can see, they look a bit like islands without any water around them. And the habitat on top of these tapuis are very different to the surrounding uh, savannas and forests that you get at the lower altitudes. These habitats on top are influenced much more by clouds and mists and lower temperatures in general, and they tend to have a lot more rain. We can also think of ponds surrounded by land or lakes um, as islands, islands of water in this case, surrounded by a matrix of land or isolated by a matrix of land. And we can also think of forests, um, small clumps of forest and larger clumps of forest, 
can be thought of as islands and they are separated by grassland. I've got a final picture down here to give you a, another idea of an island on a much smaller scale now. These um, shrubs form clumps and they're surrounded by largely bare sand. So they can be thought of as very small scale islands in a sea of sand. So larger organisms, vertebrates, birds, um, lizards, and so on, will largely be able to cross between these different clumps. But smaller organisms like some small insects and so on may not be able to cross and they will be isolated on these islands. Okay, so islands, not just pieces of land surrounded by water, but more broadly, pieces of habitat surrounded by a very different type of habitat. Having said that, we're really going to be concentrating on the traditional islands, the land surrounded by water, but we will be talking about other types of islands. And also remember that the processes which uh, we will learn about on these traditional islands, like endemism, species richness, and so on, are also valid for these other types of islands as well. Okay, physical features of islands. The location and the origin of islands is key to many of their properties and ecosystems. First of all, the location of island. Um, climate and vegetation type, these features of islands are controlled by the location on the Earth's surface. So the type of climate you get on your island is very much dependent on where that island is on the Earth's surface. And believe it or not, islands can occur on many different parts of the Earth's surface. I've got two little pictures here. This picture here shows a grassland. It's almost like a tundra, and in fact it is. This is an island called a subantarctic island, which occurs very close to Antarctica or in between the southern continents of Africa and Australia and South America and Antarctica. And this is very cold. And quite often the subsurface is frozen. So woody vegetation cannot really grow. Those are people there, not plants. Um, by contrast, this island is in the Caribbean. And actually, no, it's not in the Caribbean. This, I think, is actually in the South Pacific. But the Caribbean has very similar types of vegetation. This is a dry forest. It's a forest dominated by trees. So the climate here would be a tropical climate, very wet for part of the year, but with a substantial dry season um, so that you get um, leaves falling off the trees but there is enough primary productivity to be able to sustain trees. Here in the sub-Antarctic island, there isn't. And that is controlled by climate, so vegetation type controlled by climate, which in turn is controlled by the location on the Earth's surface. So the type of habitats, just, a lot, just like on continents, are very much controlled by the location of that land, okay? The features of the islands which are controlled by how they create, uh, were created and how old they are, are things like geology, relief or topography, size of the island, and the location relative to continents. Now, I'm not gonna go in this lecture, go into the different ways in which islands are formed, but um, let's just say that islands can be formed in different ways and depending on how they are formed, uh, mostly through some sort of geologic process, will determine the, these um, factors of that island. Geology, and quite often the geology uh, is key to the soil formation as well. Uh, whether the island is steep, like this island, or flat, like this island. Um, the size of the island, can the island get very big uh, with a particular uh, for island formation process and where that island is relative to continents. Okay, um, this location relative to continents 
uh, is particularly important when it comes to the ability of organisms to be able to cross from a continent to the island. So this is quite important. And by and large, it does tend to be controlled by the process which forms the island. Okay. Another thing that you may not know about islands is that they live and they die. Islands are transitory, um, transitory phenomena. They quite often are formed, they last for a while, um, and they get worn down, and then they disappear, particularly islands in the middle of the oceans. As you know, uh, if you've ever been to Manzanilla or Toko, the oceans are a very, very potent eroding and um, eroding weathering force. They can break down rocks very quickly in geological terms anyway. So when an island is formed, once it is stopped, um, once it stops building any further, then it begins to shrink. It begins to get eroded away. So the oceans, the wind and rain start to erode the island. So if an uh, island is formed on a volcano, as it, the volcano erupts, land is built up above the surface of the ocean. Um, when the volcano stops, quite often a coral reef grows in the shallows around the island where there is light enough and nutrients enough, enough coming from the land to support that. Uh, coral reef, and as the island gets further eroded, okay, the island gets smaller, and these reefs begin to take over from the actual basalt which formed the volcano. So the island actually begins to transform from uh, basalt or uh, some other acidic volcanic rock, some sort of um, uh, igneous extrusive rock, and it began, begins to transform into a limestone. The basalt doesn't actually transform into the limestone. The limestone grows on the basalt stub. Okay. Eventually, the volcanic rock will be lost altogether and completely covered by these coral reefs. Um, what's happen what happens in the Caribbean, and particularly in the northern uh, Lesser Antilles, these islands are actually uplifted once again. So these limestone terraces are above the water. So you get islands which are very low and flat, okay? And they are formed almost completely of limestone. But if you drill down into their core, you will find that they are igneous rock, which originally formed that volcano. So islands may disappear altogether, or they may disappear temporarily. They quite often, well, they will transform in size and shape from mountainous to flat islands, but also from large islands to small islands. And the stage that they are in their life, life cycle will impact their biota. So, um, in the young part of their life, the island is very steep. Okay, it may be still subject to disturbance by volcanic um, volcanic eruptions, so the vegetation may still be um, uh, disturbed and transformed. Um, as the island gets older, volcanic eru eruptions cease, and you start you see how the little islands greened up there. Um, vegetation grows up on it. Um, so you will get a different sort of biota. And as it gets older, the relief gets more and more subdued. The mountain gets smaller. It will get less orographic rainfall. So the vegetation will get um, change again. And finally, when it's just limestone, the vegetation again will be even more different because uh, the geology is different. Okay, But all within what will occur in this particular climate, which is dictated by the location. Okay, Physi physical features of the matrix. So the matrix surrounding the islands 
will also influence what lives on those islands. Um, uh, I call that initially the isolation. The matrix is the habitat between the islands. If we look at this island down here, this is a limestone island in the um, country of Pilau. That's in the Western Pacific near the Philippines. Um, they have these wonderful little archipelagos with all of these small little islets forming an island group, an archipelago group. And in between you will have these flats. This is probably limestone, pretty shallowly beneath the surface. So the, the matrix between these small islands is actually fairly shallow and it may be possible for organisms to cross between these islands. Certainly birds will be able to fly between them and so on. So the matrix isn't as challenging between these islets, but when you look at the matrix between this archipelago and say the next archipelago over here, for instance, it's much deeper. So that matrix, um, and it's actually much further, so that matrix is going to be much more difficult to cross. Um, I've got a other couple of pictures here to represent other features of the matrix which can um, influence what happens to the biodiversity on the islands when they have to try and cross that uh, matrix. Here we've got some pictures of some dogs all looking through a fence at something or other, probably um, a cat or some other organism which they would love to go and chase. Dogs are representative of danger in the matrix. Quite often when we have islands on land like clumps of remaining forest in a landscape which is largely being cleared by humans, you would tend to find things like dogs or predators in that matrix. And you would also tend to find things like fences and that is really going to reduce the porosity of that matrix for animals to cross it. So for instance, if you have a deer living in one of those patches of forest, they are going to find it very difficult to cross this fence to get to a next forest, okay? And that is what this uh, last picture represents as well. This is in Australia. These are emus. So they're large birds. Every so often when the climate uh, dictates it, these emus will set off um, on migration to try and find better food. And they will move through this uh, natural habitat uh, looking for better food where rain has fallen and um, plants are growing and fruiting and so on. Man or humans come along and build these fences through the um, shrublands and the emus can't cross. So in times of stress, these emus will quite often gather in these big uh, herds of emus and they will congregate along the fence and run along the fence trying to find a way across. Okay? Eventually they will find some suitable feed somewhere along the fence along this side so they will be satisfied. But this is an example of how uh, a, this habitat has been fragmented from this habitat by this matrix here, this cleared matrix, and it has made, been made impermeable by this fence here. So the porosity of this matrix, even though the distance is very small, is still impossible, at least for the emu. I think a kangaroo could probably jump over that fence horse or a kangaroo. So the properties of islands will influence the type of life that you find on them. So we're going to learn about the physical features of islands, the life cycles of islands, and also we'll touch on the, the matrix, the features of the matrix. But really what we want to know about is island life. We want to find out about the island biogeography what sort of plants and animals we get on these islands. So the course has an overall goal to teach you the current understanding of the origin and properties of plant and animal communities on islands. You live on an island here in Trinidad and also Tobago. 
and your closest regional neighbours are um, the Lesser Antilles, if we turn our back on Venezuela for the moment, and those islands which make up the Lesser Antilles and Trinidad and Tobago have a very distinct type of biogeography. There are two main processes that shape and structure these plant and animal communities, historical, uh, ecological processes and historical processes. These processes occur also on continents, um, but there are peculiar ecological processes which occur on islands because of their small compact size and the inability of other organisms to get into the island or the infrequent invasion of these islands by other organisms. Um, historical processes are also important. These are processes which have occurred a long time in the past or uh, occurred over a long period of time. So ecological processes will structure what the plant and animal communities look like now and historical processes will give the material on which the ecological processes work today. So ecological processes are acting at the moment, historical processes occurred in the past over a long time. Okay, these processes can occur on a spectrum of time scales. The boundary between them is blurred and some processes um, are occurring now but have also occurred in the past. Okay, they may occur very infrequently, um, but they also occurred now and in the past. And here are some of the uh, some examples of island organisms, all from the Caribbean. Uh, these are Caribbean cacti growing on usually on the shores of drier islands. You, we see them down the islands on um, Monas Huevos and Shakashikari. And we also would see these cacti on the shores of uh, Shagar the Shagaramas Peninsula. So these cacti are very common on the Lesser Antillean Islands, particularly in the drier parts. Okay, um, How these cacti came to be on these islands is a matter of theory and conjecture. Um, and we are going to learn some of the best of those theories and conjectures. Um, up the top here, we have an iguana. It certainly looks like an iguana, and indeed that's what it is, but it's not the same type of iguana which occurs in Trinidad. This is actually a Caymans Island iguana, and it's only found in the Cayman Islands. It has certain morphological and behavioral features which are only found in iguanas uh, which are native to the Cayman Islands, making it a separate species. So why is it a separate species? Well, probably because the population of iguanas after they arrived in the Cayman Islands uh, did not mix with any other iguanas for a very long time. So the iguanas that were found on the Cayman Islands became unique became specialized to the Cayman Islands through the process of evolution. So historical processes uh, account for this species being unique on the Cayman Islands. Uh, a, few, um, a few normal iguanas or common iguanas, widespread iguanas, made it to the Cayman Islands and it was a very isolated event and other iguanas have not made it over there since, so or very few have, and they have become very unique. All right, now this organism here um, is known as a solen solendon, a solendon, and it's found on the island of Hispaniola. So that's where the where Haiti and the Dominican Republic are, and this solendon is like no other mammal uh, around. It's in its own um, genus, probably its own family, actually. It's a very unusual organism, okay? There used to be these solenodons also on Cuba, um, but they've 
they've gone extinct now. These selenodons are only found in um, Dominican Republic now. Um, they are very unusual, as I said, and their closest uh, living relatives are now in Central America. So these selenodons probably uh, came to be on Hispaniola uh, from populations of some organism, some ancestor organism in uh, Central America or um, Mexico. So how did it get onto Hispaniola? It is thought that uh, through the process of plate tectonics, Hispaniola was once um, joined or in very close proximity to North America and Central America. North America and Central America were two separate land masses and Hispaniola was close, well, it was closest to uh, North America um, and particularly represented today by Mexico. And uh, as the Caribbean plate shifted eastwards, Haiti was carried, well, Hispaniola was carried uh, further and further to the east, and these organisms went with it. So Hispaniola has not been submerged since it separated, and so it has retained plants and animals which first came from North America. And because they have been isolated for such a long time, they have evolved into some weird and wonderful organisms. And we'll talk about that very important feature of islands, which influence its life, and that is the length of time the islands have been isolated. So if an island has is isolated today, okay, by water, um, that's one thing, and that's going to influence the current ecological processes. But if that island has been isolated by water for a very long time, that is going to mean that uh, the organisms which are on that island are going to be very different to an island which has only been isolated for a short period of time. Okay, and our Solenodon um, from Hispaniola probably speak Spanish, is a very classic example of that, and you should try and remember it. Okay, uh, our cacti are very much formed by ecological processes. These are found on the drier islands today. If those islands, same age, same origin, uh, occurred in a wetter part of the Caribbean, then this island would not have cacti and instead would have rainforest. Okay, all right, so ecological processes acting at the moment, historical processes occurred in the past or over a long period of time, and they both act together um, to shape the biota of these islands through biogeographical processes. All right, now people, people are everywhere, and we need to understand that people also shape the biota of islands, okay? So they are one of the main influences today on current ecological processes on islands. And different islands will have different uses by people, different socioeconomic features that influence um, how people impact on that island, on that island. So for instance, what do countries on that island do to make a living? Okay, is it a oil and gas based economy or an agricultural economy? If we compare, say, for instance, Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados. So Trinidad and Tobago is, as you guess, an oil based economy or oil and gas based economy, whereas Barbados was largely an agricultural based economy, at least up until recently, it's much more of a tourist-based economy now. But the oil and gas-based economy meant that people on Trinidad and Tobago tended not to clear the native vegetation. 
They didn't clear the native vegetation because they were all occupied working in the oil and gas sector. So there was much less pressure on the natural ecosystem. And so Trinidad and Tobago has a lot more native ecosystems than Barbados did. Barbados was an agricultural economy and its wealth depended on maximizing the amount of area under cultivation. So you would tend to have all the native ecosystems on Barbados have been cleared and replaced by sugarcane. All right, so Barbados as an agricultural economy or used to have an agricultural economy and that had a dramatic effect on the plants and animals that are now found on Barbados. Okay, density of the human population is also very important. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados and the Lesser Antilles in general um, have some of the highest densities of human populations in the world. Length of period of occupation by humans also has a big role to play on how much uh, forest and so on has been cleared and so on. So you're thinking, why do I have a picture of carnival here? Well, I guess um, that's an indicator too of an oil and gas economy. Um, you've got a society where there is a lot of disposable income. So getting up and playing mass is very much on the cards and very practical for people in Trinidad and Tobago. And these days it's also very practical for Barbados as well because they're much more of a tourism based economy. All right, so what makes islands special to people? Right, islands are special to people because they are different worlds. People can see them as different places. They have their own security. So a lot of people would use islands and build castles on them to be able to be protected from uh, enemies and so on on uh, the mainland. of food sources. So this picture here represents um, particular food um, that are found on islands. Um, it doesn't really capture what I really want to show though, is that on land you have plants and animals which are growing on land, and in the sea you would have um, plants and animals which grow in the sea. Both of them can be harvested. Okay, so you would have two different sets, two different types of food which are available for people. So it is no surprise that the Amerindians, when they first lived in the Caribbean, they tended to colonize the coasts of the islands. They tended to um, establish their settlements close to the oceans. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is that they had access to land-based resources and also sea-based resources. So they were much less likely to starve to death, I guess. Okay. Um, islands are special to people because they quite often have very different biota. Okay. Like that Solenodon there from Hispaniola. Um, animals, plants and animals can be very different on islands. So people, <coughs> excuse me, would tend to go to islands to look for something different. There are also models for scientific research. This is a illustration from a research paper looking at this particular type of bird. It's called a silver eye for obvious reasons. And it's found in Papua New Guinea and Australia. And this researcher looked at different populations just off the coast of um, South Eastern Papua New Guinea and various islands up through the New England archipelago. Okay, and he was researching to see how these populations of this bird differed between these different places. And by doing that, we can um, make inferences or understand the processes like evolution and um, geography and ecology which occur all around the world. 
So islands can be very good models for scientific research and they've always fascinated ecologists. So islands are special to people in a socioeconomic sense. Uh, they give security, a good diversity of food resources. They have unique and unusual biota, but they are also very good models for scientific research and the very different biota um, enables people to um, understand how evolution works and so on. Okay, so these are some of the things which we are going to consider and cover in uh, the Island Biogeography course. Um, I just want to run through quickly uh, the Caribbean. Now, I don't need to spend much time on this, do I? Because ever since high school and ever since primary school, you've been learning all about the region, the different islands in the Caribbean. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of these patterns and why they exist and how they influence the different types of plants and animals you get on these islands. Okay, all right, so I just want to give you some broad groupings of the islands of the Caribbean. Uh, we've probably heard of, but I'm going to tell you anyway, just so that everybody knows. These, this group of islands up here, okay, this group of islands up here, Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, Cuba, and Jamaica are known as the Greater Antilles. Okay, they're called the Greater Antilles because they generally consist of larger islands, don't they? This group of islands up here is, are called the Bahamas. They have a very different geological origin to the Greater Antilles and also to the Lesser Antilles. So the Bahamas are, are a separate group. Okay, then we have the Lesser Antilles. You all know the Lesser Antilles from Grenada, St. Vincent, Barbados, um, St. Lucia, uh, Martinique, Dominica, Guadeloupe, and the, the Leewards up here. Okay, so the Lesser Antilles are a separate group and they have a very different origin to the Greater Antilles. Um, you can see that they're arranged in a, a line, a sort of like an arc. And if you squint your eyes a bit, you can see that that arc tends to fork in the northern part. Okay, so actually on the island of Guadeloupe here, you have one side of the island which belongs to this particular line or arc, and the other side of the island belongs to this line or arc, okay? And we're going to take a look at that and we're going to see why that is the case. And we'll also take a look at Barbados and why that is stuck out there by itself. And the fourth group of islands of the Caribbean that we need to take a look at are the group which Trinidad and Tobago belongs to. These are the northern South American islands. So these are islands which occur on the continental shelf of South America. So Trinidad and Tobago, Margarita, don't know what that one is, um, Aruba, Bonaire and Curacao, the ABC islands. These are the um, northern South American islands. There are a few other smaller islands scattered along the coast here. But these are the four main groups that we're going to be looking at. Okay. So these are. This is a close-up of the Lesser Antilles and some of the northern um, South American islands. Okay. So these are the names of all the islands which you've probably learnt ad nauseum. Uh, this is Puerto Rico here. Some of these islands are actually geologically part of um, the Greater Antilles, okay? so, but they're pretty small. I think the dividing line might be somewhere around here. So the Lesser Antilles are formed by different geological processes to the Greater Antilles. And one indication of that is that many of the Lesser Antilles 
have active volcanoes on them, or at least have extinct volcanoes on them. Does Barbados have a volcano on it? No, it doesn't. None of the greater Antilles also have volcanoes. Okay, they may have some pretty tall mountains, but they do not have any volcanoes. Antigua, Barbuda, and the eastern side of Guadeloupe also do not have volcanoes, but they are limestone islands. And if you remember back to what I said earlier in the lecture, a limestone island may actually hide uh, a volcanic core beneath itself. Trinidad and Tobago, Margarita, whatever island that is, I can't remember. They are the on the continental shelf of northern South America. Okay, and that gives them a very different uh, origin to the Lesser Antilles and the Greater Antilles. The proximity they have to the continent of South America also has a big effect on the current ecology of these northern continental shelf islands. Okay, so in this course we're going to take a look at the plants and animals which occur on these different islands and we're going to explain some of the processes which are thought to have given rise to those patterns of plants and animals on those islands. We'll also take a look at how people are influencing the plants and animal communities on many of those islands in the Caribbean. And we will also compare um, the islands of the Caribbean to some of the other big islands around the world. And you'll see that most of the processes that we know about for islands can be found here in the Caribbean. Okay, all right, so hopefully we'll have a very good course and uh, enjoy ourselves and learn lots. So thanks very much for watching and listening and um, I will see you in the tutorial.